They say, in the dark of the night, evil will find you. And on Innistrad, there's oh so much evil and nowhere to hide. In honor of the new set, Midnight Hunt, I have for you all tonight a beautiful display of horrors from Innistrad. Leading blue-white spirits is a deck I like to call Geist in the Shell. We have the sanctified spirit of an old holy man, the Geist of St. Traft. Heading the pack of red-green werewolves, a deck I like to call Beware the Scepter. We have the one and only legendary werewolf himself, Ulrich of the Crawlin Horde. As for black vampires, we have our lovely Olivia, but this time she's mobilized for war and out for a bloody good time. And last, but certainly not least, for blue black zombies, we have the pre partner partnership of Gisa and Grolf, the ghoul caller and the stitcher. The aim of this pod is to showcase the flavor of Innistrad. As such, when I built these decks in the first draft, I started with only Innistrad block and Eldritch Moon block cards. Once I filled out the first 100, I pruned cards that felt weak and started looking for secondary strategies, as well as mana rocks that I thought would fit the decks from those blocks. After I finished looking through the inspirational blocks, I wanted to look for cards within the tribes represented in Innistrad. So, humans, spirits, angels for Geist, werewolves and wolves for Ulrich, vampires for Olivia, and zombies and humans for Gisa. One rule I had was that any legendary creatures or planeswalkers used in these decks had to be from the Innistrad or Eldritch Moon blocks, or be from the plane of Innistrad or have visited the plane to keep me on theme. Here are the timestamps for those of you looking to see a specific deck. As for the rest of you, without further ado, to the Monster Gallery. First up, we have Geist in the Shell, with Geist of St. Traft. This haunting deck uses humans and angels to create spirits and overwhelm its enemies. It has a sub-theme of blinking and flickering to surprise and frighten its opponents while overwhelming them with aerial superiority. The main focus is to have a relentless army of creatures. There are a ton of token generators and humans and spirit tribal elements across this tricky tempo-based deck. Now first up in the early game, your opening hand. This deck has the peak of its curve at around 3 CMC, so keeping a hand with 3 lands is the safest bet. But with that, you also want some creatures to throw onto the battlefield around turn 2 or 3, and then either interaction or some form of combat trick to maintain a board presence. The setup in the early game is very much where the low to the ground deck thrives as it can get in good with a few hits, and as the game goes on, it finds ways to leverage value from its humans and tokens with cards like Mentor of the Meek and Bygone Bishop. Now for the mid game, we have card advantage. Our mid game relies heavily on leveraging card advantage from our humans and spirits as well as messing with our opponents. Stealing creatures with Soul Caesar is just as valid as smashing face with a Sturmgeist. Most of the creatures around the 3 or 4 CMC slot have some ability to create or buff spirits as well. Odric Lunar Marshal can spread the love with any keywords you can manage to put on the board. Angel of Flight Alabasta can return spirits from the graveyard. We run equipment such as Slayer's Plate and Avacyn's Collar so we can turn our humans into spirits just in case they expire. Our interaction package is a mixture of blink spells and flash creatures with ETB. Spell Queller and Rattle Chains are solid examples of our creatures with Flash, and for instance, we have the basics like Cloud Shift and some increased spice with Eerie Interlude and Essence Flux. Overall, this deck doesn't like messing too much with the other players' board states, but in case it has to, we run Divine Reckoning, Sudden Disappearance, and Declaration in Stone to deal with the other go-wide strategies at the table. I'd like to shout out Thalia Heretic Cathar here, as she is a super strong stacks piece on a stick with first strike, which helps out the Lunar Marshal uh, strategy. Now, 
our end game. Some combos we have. Um, well, Geist doesn't really run all that many co game winning combos, as it is more of a value synergy style deck that can bounce back quickly or steadily overwhelm its opponents. We have some graveyard synergies with Miramad Phantasm being able to fill our yard and enchantments like Seance and Back from the Brink to let us use it like an extension of our hand. We don't have many finishers as well here, but overwhelming numbers is generally what we're looking for. So some cards that let us end the game are Increasing Devotion, which can generate us 5 bodies in the mid game or 10 bodies in the late game. Paladin Class and Always Watching act as anthems when we hit our critical mass of creatures. There's even Otherworldly Atlas, which can be fatal if the other players aren't careful and get too greedy, because Gisa and Geralt, as well as Olivia, run on self-mill and looting strategies, for most of their card advantage. Now, the spice of this deck comes from the theme itself. Since this is a spirit deck, and this is a set is an overall gothic Victorian horror theme, I looked for some creepy spine-chilling cards that fit the aesthetic like Gallows at Willow Hill, Skeleton Key, Moorland Haunt, and Ghost Quarter, to name just a few. And that, my friends, is Geist in the Shell. Beware the Scepter. Commander, Ulrich of the Crawlin and uncontested alpha. This werewolf deck is all about the pack. It uses werewolves and wolves to overtake the board, but it also has a solid instant package that can be loaded into the Isochron Scepter for some crazy Spellslinger shenanigans. Now, you're probably thinking, Spellslinger may seem counterintuitive to the way OG werewolves of Innistrad flip. Well, we have a few cards that can be used to transform them when we choose. And they happen to be under 2 CMC. There's also a few other surprises in this deck, but we'll get to that later. For the early game, your opening hand. We are looking at a high card concentration at the 2 and 3 CMC slot with this deck, so it can get really aggressive in the early stages of the game. You want a hand of two or three lands, and then mostly creatures. Having a few early game instant or ramp cards won't hurt to have, but overall the focus is to put bodies on the board and exhaust the enemy's supply of responses. For setup, Ulrich is all about the pack. So we have a pretty hefty creature package, as well as token generators. And due to the nature of old werewolves, we can do nothing while holding up interaction to transform them and force spells out of our opponents. Wolf Bitten Captive, Village Messenger, and Kessig Prowler are standouts for our one-drops, and we have Mayor of Averbrook, Scorned Villager, and Ulvenwald Captive as solid two-drops that get us to our mid-game, where I'd like to look at our card advantage. We have mostly looting spells like Dangerous Wager, Thrill of Possibilities, and Tormenting Voice, which are all instants and can be put into our scepter. Leading the pack from our creature cards that give us card advantage is Duskwatch Recruiter, of course, who lets us dig for more werewolves and wolves of the like. Other cards to look out for are Eldritch Evolution, Descendant's Path, Ulvenwald Mysteries, and Hermit of Metal Knolls, who can get the pack mad value over the course of the night. I also want to shout out Ranger Class for being a token generator an anthem, and a card advantage engine in one package. I love this card, and its flavor in this deck. I'll also put Huntsmaster of the Fells in this category because he generates tokens and can be used as a creature removal package all in one. He's very versatile for our strategy. Which leads us into interaction. Now, I think that's one of the strongest points that this deck has because of the nature of the Isochron Scepter. So, we run cards like Berserk, Beast Within, Ancient Grudge, and Destructive Revelry, as well as Daybreak Ranger. 
Now, many of our creatures double as secondary entities like Daybreak Ranger, but we also run Alana and Halana, who deal damage or draw cards respectively. And this deck may interact a lot, but it tends to do it on its own terms. So watch out. You don't want to lose steam mid-hunt with nothing to defend yourself with. We don't have much in terms of mass removal in this deck, but we do run Alpha Brawl. That's one of our main ways of dealing with the board state, though. <laughs> now, for our end games. Combos, there's really only one that this deck runs. Uh, so when I was fielding ideas for the way to make this deck, Josh was like, hey, why not make it a scepter deck? And then, lo and behold, I look for cards that work with the scepter, and we get Waxing Moon and Moon Mist. They allow us to transform our werewolves nearly at will. The problem is we don't have any tutors, so we can only draw into this condition. If you think it's spicy and want to build this deck so you can make some adjustments to get a better chance at the scepter waxing moon combo, go for it. For flavor reasons, I just wanted to have it in there as a surprise possibility. Some of my favorite finishers in this deck are mostly mass token generators that distract from our werewolves. This includes Wolfcaller's Howl, Silver for Partisan, Cult of the Waxing Moon, Kessig Cage Breakers, Feed the Pack, and Howl of the Night Pack. This crazy arsenal of token makers can easily overtake a game if left unchecked. We also run Arlen Cord and Arlen Voice of the Pack as walkers who generate wolves and give us value for them. Now, the spiciest element of this deck is the include of a secret tribe and they are hidden in plain sight for the most part. The Eldrazi have corrupted almost every aspect of Innistrad, and as such, werewolves are not exempt. So we have the Moon God itself, Emerald Cruel, the Promised End, as well as Hanwir, the Writhing Township, and a heap of other werewolf Eldrazi monstrosities to make our opponents feel uneasy in the moonlight. I'd also like to mention some of my favorite Flavors include Kessig Wolf Run, Rhythm the Wild, Hal Pack Resurgence, and Werewolf Pack Leader. Oh bloody hell. Olivia, mobilized for war. The vampires of Innistrad have become blood-mad monsters, and as such, this deck is going to be recklessly aggressive, discarding cards for madness triggers, and going for the throat with hasty creatures. Olivia, mobilized for war as your commander, gives us a way to increase the power of our creatures, and grant them haste, while also being a madness outlet. She isn't the only discard outlet. We have, and... Vampires aren't our only madness synergies. So without further ado, let's check out the party. Now, this deck, like the others, has a relative curve that sits around 3 CMC. So, an opening hand of 3 lands would be preferred. There's a decent amount of 1 and 2 drops that can get some early game value, such as Falconrath Noble, Faithless Looting, and Vessel of Volatility that can all be used to get a strong early game presence. After figuring out an opening hand, the setup for this deck should be in relentlessly attacking any and all open players. Many of our vampires grow in strength with the more blood they spill. Rakish Air, Markov Blade Master, and Falcon Wrath Exterminator all gain plus and plus one counters for doing it, and the air acts as an anthem, giving a second layer of this ability to each vampire you control. You also want to watch out for looting spells like Dangerous Wager, Tormenting Voice, and Anja's Ravager. These spells are important in the early game for card selection and land drops, but in the late game can be used for cheap to trigger madness. Looting, like I said earlier, is our main source of card advantage, as we can use it to trigger madness, which works at instant speed. So some other bits of gas to watch out for would be Anja Falconrath, who has a tap to loot effect that untaps her if you discarded a madness card. Collective Defiance, 
which is a modal spell with damage and wheeling options. There are a few spells that straight up draw cards like Succumb to Temptation and Merciless Resolve that help refill the mid, but my favorite draw card spell in this deck is Reforge the Soul, which can really mess up the other deck's strategies and also lead me into how this deck likes to interact. I'd also like to shout out the land Gyre Reach Sanitarium, as it is essentially the perfect card for this deck, allowing us to churn for answers and value while messing with our opponents. The main focus of this deck's interaction is to hit the hand, making our opponents discard keeps them from having too many tricks up their sleeves. We have Collective Brutality, Creeping Dread, and Fiend of Shadows, which all steal cards from our opponent's hand. But that's not all we have, because this deck doesn't have the token generation capabilities of the others, and it also doesn't really resurrect its creatures as often either. We run a decent amount of mass removal and spot removal to compensate. Killing Wave, Blasphemous Act, and Sever the Bloodline are three that I can name off the top. I also would like to point out some niche spot removal and other types of interaction with Olivia Voldaren and Captivating Vampire, who are extremely powerful mind control effects. Dark Imposter is an instant speed exile on a stick, and Trempanation Blade mills our opponents while buffing our edgelords. Or ladies. <laughs> our endgame is less combos and more synergies, and those synergies come from the madness elements combined with the looting effects. So we have cards that let us do it often, like Skeleton Key, or cards that just let us discard as we will, like Call the Bloodline, Stromkirk Condemned, and Murderer's Axe. Some standout madness cards are Asylum Visitor, Stenzia Masquerade, Stromkirk Occultist, and Voldaren Pariah. I have one more I want to talk about, but I'm saving that for the spice section. Now. For our finishers. Our end game is to overwhelm our enemies with a few very powerful vampires while using the strategic bits of removal and recursion to maintain a presence on the board. We have several anthems that help us clean house with our opponents, such as Stromkirk Captain, who grants first strike, Soren Imperious Bloodlord, granting lifelink and can be used to play vampires for free from our hand. Bloodline Keeper creates tokens, and then when he flips, he grants plus two plus two to all of our other vampires. Vampire Nocturnus gives flying and plus two plus two. Never least, but certainly last, is Necropolis with the Regent, who gives all of our creatures the power of exponential math, letting them get extremely huge in one or two swings. Now, for the spice. I want to talk about our Mad Lad Supreme, Falcon Wrath Gorger. This vampire gives all of our vampires madness, so he is easily the MVP when it comes to anthems. It allows us to combo off with Andre Falcon Wrath and Grave Purge to stack our vampires' return in the mid to end game. Some other flavor adds are Blood Tribute which lets us cut an opponent's life total in half, and if we tap a vampire while we do it, we get the stolen life. Very flavorful. Exquisite Blood pairs well with it because we gain any life lost by our opponents while it is on the board, so we'll gain double their life. We'll gain their entire life total, actually. And lastly, I added Elbrus the Binding Blade. Just because I want to see a vampire sneak past with flying and transform it into Withingar, who, as a 1313 flyer, who gets bigger when a player dies, I think is just a nice little cherry on top. Shout out Triskaidekaphobia in this deck because I love this card. It is one of the best finishers we have because we just kind of like beat on our opponents over the course of the game, so if they just let this sit, it could end poorly. Shout out. <laughs>
There are two types of necromancer in this world. Gisa and Garolf. This classic zombie deck is an homage to the two types of necromancers on Innistrad. The ghoul colors, represented by the black zombies, and the scabs, or scabes, represented by the blue zombies. This deck wants to mill itself and its opponents so as to use the graveyard as a resource for more zombies. It has slightly more instants and sorceries than the other decks, and deprives the other decks of their libraries in several ways. The average CMC here in this deck is between 3 and 4, so a 3 land hand is solid to keep. The highest saturation of cards in the 3 and 4 CMC slot are cards that fuel the self-mill engine, so turn 3 and 4 are critical in starting a graveyard. Alright, so to set up this pile of meat, we need to fill our yard. We have cards like Increasing Confusion, Epiphany at the Drown Yard, and Liliana's Indignation, which all act as solid early game and late game gas by scaling with the game. Now, dumping the yard is great, and having a commander who lets us cast zombies from the grave is amazing, but having some cards that can crawl out of the dirt on their own is, oh, so sweet. Gravecrawler, Relentless Dead, Scabe Ruinator, and Prized Amalgam can all be put back onto the board by their own. And that's the bare bones of the setup. Now let's move to knock them down. I've touched a bit on the type of card advantage we use being self-mill, but other half of that is going back to aristocrats and using our bodies and tokens as fodder for future fortune. So we balance grave return and sacrifice outlets for sack outlets. We have Altar's Reap, Merciless Resolve, and Grim Grin. I really want to emphasize how strong a Grim Grin is. He is an absolute unit and should be put down immediately, but keeping cards dead is the hard part when up against this sibling duo. They let us cast from the graveyard, along with Haven Ghoulich, Liliana Death's Majesty, and Ever After. They give our zombies a second lease on life, as it were. I touched on this earlier as well, but our interaction for the most part is in the form of milling and using that as resource denial. But we also run some cards that let us rob from our opponents like Dread Slaver, Stolen Goods, and Mind's Dilation. The spot removal is mostly a bounce spell based, like Compelling Deterrence and Drag Under. This deck has some nice synergies that make it play like a classic zombie nightmare. Rooftop Storm lets us pump out bodies for free. Micaeus the Unhallowed is an amazing anthem that gives us all non-humans, plus one plus one in Undying. We run Laboratory Maniac as an alternate win condition because of the sheer volume of cards that we can heap into our graveyard, with cards like Traumatize and Altar of Dementia. Now, for the fun parts. This deck, like the others in the pod, has a sub-element of tokens. Zombies being possibly the best token generators in the history of magic, I felt it necessary to make a horrific mob possible. So, we have Dark Salvation, and Under the Floorboards, for our X spells, Diagraph Colossus and Noosegraph Mob as consistent generators, and of course we have Gisa the Ghoul Caller and Stitcher Garolf. We also have Undead Alchemist, possibly the top tier of token generators in this deck, as he allows our zombies, instead of dealing damage, to mill our opponents. And while they are milling, each creature becomes a 2-2 black zombie that can mill them more. And one last card I want to touch on before getting to the spiciest elements includes this here Westvale Abbey. A personal favorite land of mine that works extremely well in a deck that can generate massive numbers of creatures and raise them from the yard with ease. If you can flip this land into Ormondal the Profane Prince, well, the game may be over sooner than your opponents expect. Now, 
I want to talk about four cards that sit above all others in my eyes when it comes to this deck. First, we have Endless Ranks of the Dead. This menace to society gives you tokens equal to half the number of zombies you already have. Basically, you need two zombies to make more zombies, but this can get out of control very quickly. Second, we have Army of the Damned. 13 zombies for 8, or 13 zombies for 10. Either way, I'm down for 13 zombies. I love this card. It's so egregiously zombie. Third is Grimoire of the Dead. This bad boy gets a shout out for being my first ever pet card. I put it in everything just because I loved it so much. And I mean, come on. It lets you resurrect all graveyards if you can get three counters on it. So it forces a reaction at some point where everyone dies. And last and most certainly not least is Zombie Apocalypse. Six mana for the return of all our precious zombies to the battlefield and the subsequent destruction of every human. Now this hits hard in this pod because there's a subtle sub-theme of humans scattered all through the decks. So, balancing this pod was fun. First, let's start with the colors. Each two color combination has awesome specialties that when brought to light helped me balance. With each being distinct enough to have its own identity in the pod while also being similar enough thematically to fit with the creepy aesthetic of Innistrad. I'm gonna put on screen an overview of the mechanics that each deck uses. So we have blue-white, Flyers, Blink and Flicker, Flash, Angels, Humans, and Spirits. Blue-Black is Mill, Grave Return, Zombie Tokens, and Sacrifice Effects. Red-Green is Fog, Fight, Transformation, and Wolf Tokens. And Black and Red is Vampires, Spot Removal, Mass Removal, Hand Destruction, and Madness. Now, for the play experience. This pod should play for about an hour. The decks are built at a lower power level, so they are similar to a pre-con in that regard. They are super easy to upgrade because of that. Each deck has a solid number of hard counters to at least two other decks. I've learned a bit from my last endeavor. I also compressed the curves of the decks to be very similar and focused on different card types and how that affects playstyle. Geist and Ulrich have the most instant speed responses between spells and flash whereas big sorceries and stronger individual creatures are the realm of Olivia and the siblings. To stay on theme, we have Geist and the siblings using very persistent graveyard-based strategies and token swarm, whereas Olivia and Ulrich played the board more and valued their creatures' presence there. But they also run a few ways of returning them, so they need to be more aggressive using more anthems, haste, and other aggressive mechanics to compensate. Now, the majority of the cards in each deck are from Innistrad and the Shadows over Innistrad blocks, with a few flavorful or strategic specific additions. Innistrad is one of my favorite planes in the entire multiverse, to the point where Olivia is our channel mascot, and Josh and I have both made at least four different versions of her original printing as a commander deck each. The set, or the plane, went from Victorian horror to Eldritch Abominations, to this ominous Halloween cult-like vibe of Midnight Hunt. As I'm writing this now, we only have a few bits of art from Crimson Vow, but it looks like a vampire wedding is coming up. And this plane has brought so many memorable creatures and planeswalkers and stories like Soren, Liliana, Thalia, Avacyn, Grizzlebrand. I love this homage to all things that go bump in the night, and I hope you love these decks. Happy hunting, happy haunting, and remember, untap, upkeep.